Hey everybody, welcome to the MSK Lectures. In this one, we're going to talk about common shoulder, elbow, and wrist complaints slash injuries. So let's dive in. Let's start here with shoulder pain. Now, the first condition that we're going to discuss is the most common cause of shoulder pain, which is a condition known as shoulder impingement syndrome or rotator cuff tendinopathy. So the risks associated with the development of this condition really include any kind of activity that involves repetitive repetitive activity at or above the shoulder. So consider athletes who are performing throwing motions, baseball players, football players, or even those with occupations who have the same sort of similar overhead motion. So if you're a painter and you're constantly doing um, overhead activity like this, anything that uh, is repetitive and overhead, you should consider this as a common problem. So the pain here is going to be made worse by these overhead activities. So the patient will typically point to either the deltoid or lateral arm when they are asked where the pain is occurring. So, you know, somewhere in this general vicinity. And the pain with this condition is often made worse at night when the patient's not distracted and they're trying to fall asleep, especially if they're trying to sleep on that affected shoulder. Now, on physical exam, the patient will have tenderness at the subacromial space or posterior aspect of the shoulder. And tenderness when that area is palpated is usually going to be positive. Now, when assessing the patient's strength with abduction and external rotation to resistance, strength will be intact. But halfway be between that abduction or that external rotation, you will see that the patient reports pain. Now, some impingement tests that will be positive are the near and the Hawkins-Kennedy impingement test. So the Hawkins-Kennedy test involves putting the patient in 90 degrees of shoulder flexion and 90 degrees of elbow flexion. Then when internally rotating the arm, if the patient reports pain, that would be a positive finding, a positive test. The near impingement test involves stabilizing the patient's scapula with one hand and then flexing the arm while internally rotating it. If this maneuver causes pain, we would say the near impingement test is positive. So imaging, is diagnostic for shoulder impingement syndrome or rotator cuff tendinopathy and dynamic MSK ultrasound shows the site of impingement and the tendons and the tendons that would be involved. Now treatment will be ice for the affected area, avoiding activities that cause the symptoms and then treating with NSAIDs for around a week or so as well as physical therapy if it is a bad case. Now if we take that a step further we have rotator cuff tear. This can also result from overuse uh, from sports and activities that involve the, that same overhead motion, but it can also just occur from trauma that involves the shoulder. Now with this, patients present with pain in the lateral deltoid that is made worse by those overhead activities as well as lying on the affected shoulder at nighttime. On physical exam, you'll see the patients typically have weakness with resisted abduction and external rotation. So as opposed to shoulder impingement syndrome, where there's no weakness, but there's pain, here you'll actually have weakness. Now, this is one of the major ways on, on, uh, on, on the exam to distinguish, like I said, that rotator cuff tendinopathy from that rotator cuff tear. Whereas the tear leads to weakness, tendinopathy is painful, but shouldn't cause weakness. So keep that in mind. I know I said it twice, but it's important that I really drill that point home. Now, some other exam maneuvers that we can do here include the painful arc test, which is having the patient elevate the arms in the scapular plane, then reversing the motion. And this is positive if the patient has pain between 60 and 120 degrees. Another test for a rotator cuff tear is the drop arm test, where you elevate the patient's arm to 90 degrees abducted, and then you release the arm and let the patient lower the arm back to a neutral position with the palm down. If the patient's arm drops suddenly or they experience pain with that movement, then we would consider this test to be positive. Now, imaging is needed in order to make a diagnosis of a rotator cuff tear, and this can be achieved either with an experienced user performing an MSK ultrasound showing tendon tears, but more likely we would do an MRI, and a great amount of detail can be shown here, including the degree of the tear, if there is any tendon retraction, as well as if there's any muscular atrophy. Now, if the tear is partial, we'll typically veer towards the side of conservative management, so activity avoidance, NSAIDs, and physical therapy. For those who are able to tolerate surgery, surgical repair is needed for an acute full thickness rotator cuff tear, okay? So partial tear, and it's not too bad, conservative treatment. Full tear, needs surgery. However, those with a partial rotator cuff tear who undergo conservative management that fails, 
in that instance, surgery would be warranted. All right, let's move on now to another condition known as frozen shoulder, aka adhesive capsulitis. So this is a condition that typically progresses from initial shoulder pain, often that's worse at night, and then over months develops into worsening stiffness while the pain becomes less intense. Eventually, patients develop a significant loss of passive and active abduction and external rotation at the shoulder. The ROM, the range of motion loss, is what you should most strongly associate with this disorder. On physical exam, the patient will have limited active and limited passive range of motion with external rotation and abduction. Now, the history and the physical exam finding is usually enough to make a diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis. Now, if there's a possibility of some other shoulder pathology, then an MRI can be performed, which in the case of adhesive capsulitis would show thickening of the joint capsule. Now, treatment here is variable, and a lot of these therapies only provide temporary relief. But in terms of escalating treatment, we have physical therapy, which aims to increase the range of motion over time. We have a short course of oral steroids or intra-articular glucocorticoid injections, which again, they'll work well for a few weeks before the symptoms then worsen. And then we have intra-articular dilation. And the goal there is to try and enlarge the capsule to allow for more movement. Finally, last case, surgery can be, be done to perform arthroscopic release of the joint. That's, of course, if all other modalities fail. All right, let's move on to the elbow. First, let's start with a lateral epicondylitis. This is also known as tennis elbow. Now, this condition is brought on by repeated actions that involve the forearm, whereby the patient will describe the pain that is typically directed over the lateral aspect of the elbow. Now, on exam, there will be tenderness to palpation over the lateral epicondyle and proximal wrist extensor muscles, as well as pain with resisted wrist extension when that elbow is fully flexed. The patient will also report pain with passive terminal wrist flexion with the elbow fully extended. So some specific uh, physical exam maneuvers that we can do to test for lateral epicondylitis include the book test, where we have the patient hold a heavy book on the, on the hand on the side with the elbow pain, and they should hold the book out in front of them with the elbow fully extended and the palm facing down, such as this. Pain in the lateral epicondyle would make that test positive. Now, the tennis elbow test is performed by placing the patient's extended elbow in one of the physician's hands. Then the physician would put their thumb on the patient's lateral epicondyle. The patient will then make a fist, pronate their arm, and radially deviate and extend the wrist while the physician resists these movements. The test is considered positive if the patient feels pain in the lateral epicondyle. Diagnosis here does not require imaging, just a history and physical exam that's consistent with our diagnosis. Treatment would be avoiding exacerbating movements, icing after movements if they cannot be avoided, using NSAIDs, acetaminophen, as well as physical therapy if the condition persists. All right, let's move on now to medial epicondylitis, the medial aspect. This is also known as golfer's elbow or golf elbow. Now, pain in this condition is felt at the medial aspect of the elbow, and it's made worse with bending the wrist towards the palm. On exam, the patient will report tenderness to palpation of the medial epicondyle and possibly the proximal wrist flexor muscles. They will also generally have pain with resisted wrist flexion when the elbow is extended, as well as pain with passive terminal wrist extension, meaning the physician moving the wrist to its max point of extension, causing pain. Now, the special maneuver here that, can, that we can use to test for golfer's elbow is called the golfer's elbow test. To perform this maneuver, the physician is going to stabilize the patient's extended elbow in one hand, placing their thumb on the patient's medial epicondyle, while the patient forms a fist and supinates the forearm, while also deviating and flexing the wrist to the ulnar side, while the physician, of course, uses their other hand to provide resistance by grabbing hold of the patient's enclosed fist. This test is positive if it elicits pain at the medial epicondyle. Now, just as a side note here, I don't believe that you're going to need to know the specific details of is, is, is the uh, physician grabbing this, is, is, is the uh, patient doing that. I think they'll probably just tell you that the test was positive or the test was negative. It seems um, more so of a step one type of question to get into the specific movements and, and structural components of this. Um, now, I'm not saying I wouldn't know it. I'm just saying don't bog yourself down with the details. Make, make sure you understand the clinical uh, significance of this test more so than anything else. Now, just as with the lateral epicondylitis, the diagnosis here does not require imaging. We just need a history and a physical exam that's consistent with the diagnosis. 
Treatment is going to be avoiding those exacerbating movements, icing any movement, uh, icing the area after movements if they can't be avoided, giving NSAID, the acetaminophen, and if the condition persists, uh, giving getting the patient physical therapy. So it's the exact same sequence of steps taken as with lateral epicondylitis. So that makes your life a little bit easier. You just have to remember one series of steps. All right, next up, we have a very commonly tested condition known as carpal tunnel syndrome. This occurs when the median nerve is compressed as it travels through the wrist, causing symptoms of pain, numbness, and tingling in the areas that are innervated by the median nerve. Now, this includes the first three digits and the radial half of the fourth digit. The patient may also experience these symptoms in the wrist. Now, the symptoms can be worsened at night here with tasks that cause repetitive flexing or extension of the wrist or if the patient keeps their hand or arm in an unsupported sustained position for a long period of time, right? So uh, specific uh, positions made worse at night. On physical exam, we do have a few tests we can do to help support the diagnosis of carpal tunnel. You should remember these from your step one studies. We have the Phelan maneuver and the Tinnel test. The Phelan maneuver involves having the patient fully flex their wrist by pressing the dorsal surfaces of the hands together for one minute. And if the symptoms of pain or numbness and tingling arise, we consider that test to be positive. Then we have the Tinnel test. This simply involves tapping the wrist over the area where the nerve travels. If this elicits symptoms of tingling or numbness, it is a supportive finding. Now, the way the diagnosis is definitively made here is with electrodiagnostic testing, specifically nerve conduction studies, and they are going to show us impaired median nerve conduction across the carpal tunnel. Treatment here depends really on the severity. If we're dealing with a mild case, we can do splinting uh, glucocorticoid injections into that carpal tunnel, as well as oral glucocorticoids if needed. Now, if these therapies are unsuccessful or the patient has moderate to severe symptoms, then surgical decompression can be performed to help relieve those symptoms. All right, let's finish this lecture with some content review questions. I'm going to put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is B, nerve conduction studies. Next question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. I'm sure you'll need more, so hit that pause button. Once you got the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is C. And we have one more question. I will put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back. The correct answer here is D. Okay, remember, no weakness should be seen in rotator cuff tendinopathy. That is a sign of more likely a rotator cuff tear. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.